South Florida. We welcome you to the Praise the Lord program. No matter where you're watching, anywhere around the world, this entire group right here in South Florida, they love Jesus yes, here tonight. Is that true? Come on now. And I want to say this, that it's not very often that we're hosting and I have my pretty little pink haired mama <laughs> yes. with me. And her name is Janet Crouch. Okay, you yes. love yes. the, uh, not, yeah, not only Florida, but you love the subject oh. of the gospel of oh. grace. Why, why do you love the gospel you of grace? You know what, it has just transformed my thinking. Okay, how? Told just peace, joy, just, it just, it just absolutely takes it off of your back and puts it on to Jesus where it should be. And it's just an amazing Okay, are you, teaching. is it something that you are discovering later in life? Tell me, tell Real me. Real late. I'm 76 <laughs> that late. <laughs> but it is amazing. Why did we, why did somebody years and years ago write Amazing Grace? How sweet the sound that saved a rich like me. Okay. Yeah. Now, are you telling me that that you would have gotten saved every week when you were growing up? Is that kind of... Of course we did. Yeah. So when you grew I up, you I got saved I, every I week. I needed to. I she probably that. did, I in a way. I needed it, but I, I, I did it, you know? Okay. I mean, I, everything you did... You, thought, you know what was so sad about it is I think people thought that every time that they failed, that when they got saved, then there was a, the rules and the regulations of Christianity and, and you climb the ladder and you try to do the best you could, but then you would fail and you'd fall and then you would feel like you'd drop to the, to the bottom again and you'd have to start over again. But I have read a book. Yeah. <laughs> that I have just been bawling over the last few days. We should have read a book and found it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah really. It's been here all along yeah, for, really. for thousands of years. Um, but sometimes it takes someone to, to speak it in just a way. Impart. impart and it. impart it. And, you know, Joseph Prince has just been a, an amazing, an amazing teacher of grace. Tullian Chavidjan has written a book called One Way Love that brings so much it's like when freedom comes and grace comes and you receive all that Jesus did he did it all it's finished it's done that it makes you want to do more it does. It does. <laughs> and I love yes. that about and, and how you describe that and how you and how you talk about it and what makes me so thrilled is tonight that no matter where you are watching anywhere on this planet called earth God has made a way for you to hear and for you to listen to be freed in your spirit free in your mind free in your soul to do what God's called you to do and that's what Trinity broadcasting and I love you I love you I love you for sticking it out for taking one step at a time with Papa and you guys have old. for 40 years I'm sorry, 41 year happy birthday to you. How about 56 years? We were 56 married. you were married. At 41 years, you have just taken one step, one, one step. faithful step. And as you did that, God in His all His greatness and faithfulness has made a way that all of us can hear the message of grace. And I think that TBN was raised up for nights like this. Yes. Because we're not, we're not just going to talk about some religion. Yeah. Jesus was trying to tell us that it was the end of religion. Christianity okay? took and it all away. Christianity <laughs> somehow, uh, you know, got mistaken with just the very awesome knowledge of that Jesus, while we were yet sinners, died for us. That's right. And that's, I think, what tonight's program is about. Let me just, let me just, first of all, uh, Tolian Chavidjan. Uh, well and, done. And thank you. Uh, well done. Make... Holly and welcome to the Praise of yeah. Lord program. His new book, One Way Love. Um, let's do this. Let's 
let's explain to everybody that this book is kind of a manifesto. Yeah. This is a bit of a 91st yeah. thesis mm. of today's generation. Put your and hammer you're, and nail. You're, you're really not, you're not messing around. And I think that what you're trying to do with this book is you're trying to impart something mm. that's super important. Take the first few minutes now and just kind of share with us why this book and this subject mm. is the difference between maybe life and death in a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, as has already been mentioned, I mean, grace, grace is our only hope. Yeah. It's our lifeline. And all too often it gets lost in sort of this moralistic, do more, try harder religiosity that all too often we find in churches, we find behind pulpits. I mean, I've talked to lots of people both inside and outside the church who, for whatever reason, are disenchanted with church, disenchanted with Christianity, because they've come to believe that Christianity is all about performing for God, doing for God, living for God, when in fact the focus and the foundation of the Christian faith has been lost, which is not living for God, which is our response yeah. to God's work for us, but it's this glorious powerful reality that God and Jesus has lived for us. Wow. And there's a huge difference between believing that my uh, standing with God, God's approval of me, God's acceptance of me, God's love for me is dependent on me and what I do wow. rather than what Jesus has already done for me. So the focus of the Christian faith is not the life of the Christian, it's Jesus. Yeah. And as I often tell people when you think about the story of uh, Peter being summoned by Jesus to join him walking on the water. Yep. They see Jesus coming from a distance. They think he's a ghost at first, and then they realize it's him, and Jesus says, come join me on the water. Peter's never gotten out of the, I mean, he's never walked on water before. Um, and so in faith, he gets out and starts walking on the water, and he's doing just fine until he takes his eyes off of Jesus and looks down to see how he's doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then he begins to sink. And I think lots of Christians are sinking because they are not fixing their eyes on Jesus and what he's done, yeah. but rather what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, and so I think um, the great Presbyterian minister, James Montgomery Boyce, once said that Romans 8.1, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not just the thesis of Romans 8. It's not just the thesis of Romans as a whole, but it's the thesis of the Bible. Yeah. Um, this idea that if you are a Christian, you live your life under a banner that reads, it is finished, yes. wow. paid in full. Um, and I think that's oftentimes lost in our desire to live right and do right, which, by the way, if you take God's law seriously, where Jesus says, be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect, it should crush you and break you to the point where you go, my only hope yeah. is Jesus and what he's done because even when I think I'm doing a good job, wow. I'm failing. I remember telling someone, well, I was speaking at a large conference and, and I said, one of the comments I made was, because Jesus succeeded for you, you're free to fail. And some guy comes up to me afterwards and he said, you just encouraged 3,000 people to fail. And I said, I got, I got two things to say. Number one, these people were all failing just fine before I said a word. <laughs> wow. um, and number two, I didn't encourage failure. Failure is not a virtue, but failure is a fact. And acknowledging failure is most definitely a virtue. Wow. And the glorious good news of the gospel is that when we fail, God loves us still because of what Jesus has done. Our approval, our acceptance before God is never in question, ever. It's a done deal. Um, and that right there doesn't encourage laziness mm -hmm. to me. It doesn't make me apathetic toward life. Yeah. It actually makes me want to love others the way God has loved me. It makes wow. me want to serve others the way God has served me. And so I think sometimes people go, you can't preach this free grace stuff too much because it will cause people to be apathetic about the way they live or be overly tolerant of sin in their lives and all of that stuff as if grace is going to get in the way of following God. Yeah. Um, and I said, when a heart has been genuinely gripped by grace, 
something beautiful happens. It's called self-forgetfulness. Wow. Now you're not thinking wow. about me and what I need to do. You're thinking about Jesus and what he's done, which yes. then overflows into a life of service to our neighbor. Um, so that now I can, I can have a relationship with you knowing that everything I need in Christ I already possess. I can now spend the rest of my life giving to you without needing anything from you um, <laughs> because everything I need I have yes. and that is absolute freedom because bondage is I my relationship with you is based on this idea that I need to get something from you mm -hmm. in order to feel like I matter in order to in order to get worth and value and significance I need to extract something from you and so now the pressure is on for me to manipulate you um, you know, use you, that sort of thing. And when you go, everything I need in Christ I have, therefore I can give you everything without needing you to give me anything. That's wow. huge. That's huge. huge. You are listening to Tolian Chavidjan, his new book, One Way Love, uh, just out. Uh, we got introduced to it. Uh, Lori read it. She's been crying for about a week <laughs> because of, of how beautiful it is. You got to do one thing for me. Uh, give me a kind of a double bicep shot here. Kind of do it. Just, just because I want you to explain your your well, my, uh, my, your tats. my tattoos. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I've got one going down the my forearm over here. To telestai, it's simply Greek for it is finished. Right. Uh, this is a Latin abbreviation, an old Latin abbreviation for the word of the Lord abides forever. Okay. And then Martin Luther, my favorite theological phrase, a phrase that changed my life in college, was a phrase coined by uh, the great reformer Martin Luther, simul justus et peccator, which means simultaneously justified and sinner. Wow. So I have justus on my right arm, which means justified, and peccator on my left bicep, which means sinner. So the goal was, and I've got a couple more on my shoulders, but um, the goal was that if something ever happened to my voice, I could stand up shirtless on Sunday morning <laughs> and the gospel would still go forth. That was the goal. <laughs> Not to mention, to be quite honest with you, every morning I wake up, I have to be reminded that it is finished. Yes. Wow. I have to be reminded yes. because... Uh, we forget. I mean, you know, I say this to people all the time. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves yes. every day because we forget it every day. You mentioned uh, just a minute ago that there are some people who say, wait a second, you can't teach grace too hard. Yeah. Uh, because grace, but. Yeah, grace butts but. and breaks, I call it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in your book, you also uh, talk about, well, st start there. So right. just kind of. What do you say to the person that says, wait a second, Grease you know, and grace. The, the, grace. The, 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 you know, you, you talk about it in your book mm -hmm. by saying those people actually have low regard for the law. That's right. Kind of jump into that because I thought that was Yeah, I, one of the things I address because that is a common objection to those like me who are just militant in their preaching of God's grace. And extending your and arms extending, out. Yeah, militant <laughs> about... Um, <laughs> But so one of the things that I say on a regular basis, and I talk about it at length in the book, is the, the problem in the church today is not cheap grace. The problem in the church today is cheap law. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when we reduce God's requirements uh, to something smaller than the perfect righteousness of Jesus, we cheapen God's law and be perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect now gets cheapened into just do your best. Well, I can deceive myself every day into thinking I'm doing my best and the moment I start believing that I'm pulling it off, grace becomes much less amazing to me because wow. now I'm, I'm actually doing it myself and so you need the heaviness of God's law constantly telling you be perfect. I mean, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, it's a great, great place to go in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, you've heard it said that, you know, uh, if, you, if you don't kill anyone, you're doing fine. But I say, if you've ever been angry mm -hmm. for a second, um, you're just as guilty before God as the one who kills someone. Or you've heard it said, don't commit adultery and you'll be doing fine. But if you've ever had a lustful thought for a split second, you're just as guilty as the adulterer in yeah. God's court. And so, and then he culminates that whole section by saying, therefore, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And his whole goal in doing that was to level the playing field 
and to crush people in such a way that they would come to the realization, my only hope is Jesus yeah. and wow. what he does on behalf yeah. of sinners. Wow. So, and he says, I mean, Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. So Jesus fulfilled, I mean, Jesus fulfilled all of God's holy conditions so that our relationship to God could be wholly unconditional. Yeah. So you're making the reverse point. Mm -hmm. Someone that thinks there can be too much grace has a low regard for That's exactly for right. That's, yep, that's exactly right. And that is, I think, a super important point here. Um, this idea that we have cheapened the law into something we can do. Wow. And once we cheapen God's requirements into something we can do, then Jesus becomes that much less relevant and necessary for us. But once the law, once the standard of God's law is raised so high that even the best of us look at it and go, I, I can't do it. Yeah. I can't pull it off. Um, then we end up saying things like, you know, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Jesus paid it all. Thank God this whole thing is riding on the strong shoulders of another. It's my only hope. Yeah. yeah. Tell him, talk about uh, when people get saved, it's just supposed to take you deeper. Yeah. I, well, I grew up going to church, right. and when I heard the word gospel, I thought that was what people outside the church needed. Right. So the gospel for me was synonymous with evangelism. Okay. Um, I mean, it was this is this is what non Christians need. But then once God saves you, He moves you beyond the gospel into something else. But when you read the Bible more carefully, what you discover is that once God saves you, He doesn't then move you beyond the gospel. He moves you more deeply into the gospel. Mm -hmm. That the gospel is not just the ABCs of the Christian faith; it's the A to Z of the Christian wow. faith. And that the gospel doesn't just ignite the Christian life, but it fuels the Christian life. And the reason for that is because we're so forgetful and we start believing our own press, we need to be constantly hearing it is finished. Yeah. We never, I don't care if you've been a Christian for five minutes or 50 years, you never, ever, ever outgrow your need to hear it is finished, yeah. ever. Or you're the righteousness of God. That's and right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And... Five minutes, 50 years, or 70 years. Hmm. Yeah, that's the truth. You know what? I don't know if we made it known to the people that may have never seen Tully and Vigiani before that you are Billy Graham's grandson. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the Billy Graham. Yeah. His mother is Gigi yep. Wilson. Yeah. Tavidian yep. Wilson. Yeah. And you are Billy's grandson. I what am. did your grandfather think of this? I'm I'm sure he thinks it's wonderful. Well, he's of course ecstatic in part because I was uh, a terribly rebellious teenager. Oh, do uh, tell. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah. I, I love to tell the story. I think actually I think it gives some historical context into why I'm so passionate yeah. about this message. Why were we preachers kids so rebellious? Yeah, I, don't, I know. Speak well, I was, I, listen, did you I get thrown out, out of Bible school? Oh, I didn't have, <laughs> I did. He got thrown out of the uh, house. But I, I mean, I, uh, it was, for me, it was worse. It wasn't just that I had a preacher in the family. I mean, my granddad's the preacher. My dad was a psychologist. So you yeah, can imagine you the combination of being the grandson of a preacher and the son of a psychologist, you're doomed to fail. How did that um, make you feel? Yeah. I know. What are you really feeling, son? Like, um, so I am, um, yeah, I, I'm born into a Christian home where God gave me this unbelievable heritage, yeah, wow. middle of seven children. Uh, the flavor of Christianity expressed in my home growing up was not oppressive or legalistic. Mm -hmm. It was warm and hospitable mm -hmm. and inviting. We were taught at a young age take God seriously, never take yourself too seriously. So uh, our, the, the Chavijan love language is sarcasm. Um, <laughs> oh, welcome you know, to we my used world. To, we, we continue to build each other up by tearing each other down. Um, <laughs> lots of fun, lots of camaraderie. But for whatever reason, maybe it's because I was a middle child, but I couldn't really figure out where I fit inside my family. Mm. And so when you're young and you're desperate to belong, uh, and you don't know where you belong inside the home, you make some pretty foolish decisions about how you can decide where to belong outside the home. So at a young age, I started hanging out with people I shouldn't have been hanging out with and doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And 
all of that culminated at the ripe young age of 16 when my parents said, we love you, but if you're going to continue living this way, you can't live this way under our roof. And so they wow. literally kicked me out of the house. They had tried everything, private school, public school, counseling, you name it. Uh, kicked me out of the house. I, I was actually escorted off of our property by the police. Um, and I dropped out of high school. And I thought that was the greatest thing that ever happened. I mean, no, no teachers breathing down my neck. No parents, you know, looking over my shoulder. I was finally free um, to pursue all the things I thought would make me happy. And the Bible says that sin is pleasurable for a season. But when that season comes to an end, you're left with a gaping hole in your soul that only God is big enough to fill. And that season came to an end for me at 21. And it wasn't one particular event or one particular crisis. It was just this culminating sense of there's got to be more to life than what I'm experiencing. There's got to be more to who I am than what this world is telling me. And the hound of heaven tracked me down wow. and magnificently defeated me and raised me from death to life. I haven't been the same since. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> something happened to me shortly after I became a Christian that I think happens to lots of people shortly after they become Christians. Um, and that is I started to get better. It's a terrible thing when you start wow. to get better. And what I mean by that is uh, you actually stop doing some bad things and you start doing some good things, and that part alone is good. Um, but you actually start growing, at least in your own heart and mind, you start growing out of desperation and the moment you begin thinking you're not as desperate as you used to be, mm -hmm. grace ceases to be amazing to you. Mm -hmm. And so I became a moralist, mm -hmm. really. I mean, the focus, it, the, what happened to me was six months, a year after God saved me, um, I mean, the focus stopped being Jesus and what he had done, and it started becoming all about me and what I need to do. Wow. And uh, that went on for a number of years, and I finally just crashed and burned. 2000 and 8, 2009 was a crash and burn year for me. And it was like I was converted all over again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally came to the end of myself. I have a friend named John Zoll who says that God's office is at the end of our rope. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> that grace always flows downhill. And I remember during that season in my life coming to the end of myself in such a way that the only way out was up. And, um, and it, again, it wasn't one particular crisis or one particular event. It was just this, I was burning out fast because I was running on my own steam. <laughs> um, and God's grace became so real to me during that period of time in my life. Um, and that is literally when I sensed God saying, this is the message I want you to preach until the day you die. Mm -hmm. Wow. Don't, you don't, you've got, I'm putting one bullet in your gun. Mm -hmm. One bullet in your gun. You're going to say it every week, every time you open, every, with every tweet, every blog post, every book, every comment, every interview, every sermon, you've got one thing to say. Wow. Um, and so that's what I've been doing You know, since the then. TVN was founded for the very purpose of guys like yourself looking into your camera mm -hmm. There could be some people that were in the same place you were in 2009 mm -hmm. that are just thinking that they're there at the end of the rope, mm -hmm. even though they've been a Christian. Grace is such a beautiful thing, mm -hmm. but it may not have been presented. Somebody mm -hmm. might be thinking, those people on the couch, they've got their act together, all these folks yeah. here in Southern California, yeah. or Southern Cal South Florida yeah. here. <laughs> uh, I live in Southern Cal, sorry, uh, and uh, that, that they all are suited up and they look like all the, nobody has any problems in this studio, uh, but what if you could present the gospel in a way that you know changed mm. your life? Yeah. Why don't you look into your camera and do that? Yeah, I would say that God loves Come on. bad, weak people because bad and weak people are all that there are. Wow. Um, and that you never, ever, you, it, it's impossible to out -sin the coverage of God's forgiveness. It's impossible. That there is absolutely nothing we can do to separate ourselves from God's love Beautiful. for us in Christ Jesus. I mean, I think I have to go back all the time, especially when I fail, especially when I fail, which is regularly, um, daily, almost moment by moment, I have to always go back to Romans 8, always go back to Romans 8 and be reminded by God himself through the Apostle Paul 
that there is nothing that can separate me from God's love, that God's love for me is not dependent on what I do, but it's ultimately dependent on what Jesus has done, that God doesn't love me more when I'm doing well, and he doesn't love me less when I'm not doing well, that God's love for us is constant, it's Beautiful. fixed, and you're in forever. And so that alone gives you, it gives me, um, just the capacity to process failure and bad seasons in life and brokenness when we know that our standing with God is forever fixed, forever fixed because of what Jesus has done, that this whole thing is riding on Him. And thankfully that's true because if it's riding on you or if it's riding on me, we're all in big trouble. So I, God's grace is real. It's the most real reality in the universe. It's the only thing that saves me on a daily basis. And like I said, if you are a Christian, you live your life under a banner that reads, it is finished. Beautiful. And that's what you need to know more than anything. Pray for him. In case somebody doesn't know how to yeah. even accept Christ, just yeah. they could be I'd watching in a prison, they, you know, they yeah. could be watching anywhere around the world. Just help yeah. them. I'd love to. Let's pray. God, thank you for your amazing grace. We are ill-deserving, train-wrecked sinners. Wow. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were at our worst, you gave us your best. And that's so difficult to believe. It's so, it's impossible to believe unless you grant us belief. Thank you, unless you give us faith. It's impossible to believe, but I pray that you would open our eyes and soften our hearts and help us to see Jesus for who he is and for what he's done for us. I, I pray that you would massage the good news of the gospel down you, deep into our bones and help us to believe it. We pray uh, like the father of the sick girl, we believe but help thou our unbelief. Yeah. And so I pray, oh God, that by your spirit you would be even right now overpowering unbelief, that you would be granting belief in the radicality of your amazing grace in the outrageousness of your mercy. And I pray that you would help all of us, those watching by television, me, I pray that you would help all of us to know that because Jesus has done what he's done for sinners, we can be set free. We can be liberated Thank from you, the Lord. pressure to generate our own worth and our own value and our own significance by what we do because Jesus has paid it all and given it all to us for free. So help us to believe it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. I, one thing that Matt and I have both experienced is that I was, I was raised in church. And... Um, I love when you point out that Paul at the end of his life, he said, I am the chief of sinners. And it's hard for the, the people who love God and try and, and do and, and are exhausted mm -hmm. by trying so hard. And you talk about that. This is a book for them, the, the, the exhausted. And um, grace frustrates people that think they're good. You know, and, and I love how you talk about when Jesus, when the Pharisees were talking to Jesus, he wasn't condemning them for the things they did right, mm. but because they demeaned the people mm. that didn't live up mm -hmm. to their, to their standards. Yeah. You know, and, and that's where the, the, the value of the law comes from, mm. that Jesus knows our hearts. Mm. And, you know, there's, there's not a day that goes by that we're not Jesus, you know, <laughs> that we don't sin, that we don't think, you know, if thoughts could kill, you'd be dead, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know, that there is, God knows our hearts. Mm -hmm. But the people who, one time I was in such a desperate, such a desperate area or, or a time in our life that we just needed God to do a miracle for us. 
And I remember saying, God, if you would just, if you would just do something right now, and, and we just didn't have to try so hard. Mm. Look at all that we could be doing for you, because I think out of a heart of everything I do for you, I'm going to try to do everything right for you and to give you glory for it. But look at all that we could be doing if you'd just help us and give us this miracle right now. And it was like God clubbed me upside the head with the most beautiful two by four I'd ever received. And I said, that is the most arrogant thing I have ever heard anybody say. And I said it, it came out of me. Look at all that I could be doing for you if you would just do a miracle for me. And Jesus spoke to me so clearly, don't you ever think it's anything that you do for me. Mm. Mm. It's all what I've done for you. Amen. That's it. That's it. And I I want to... I'm telling you, this book will change your life. Please get this book. I I have ordered... Many of them, and uh, I'm sending them to everybody I know. So, Javen, you're getting one in the mail here soon. Your final, final you thoughts. I, I, I want to I kind of get your, your final thoughts. I want to give you one second, though, because just like she had a moment, I was getting ready to get on an airplane and fly into Baghdad, you know, I mean, Baghdad. Remember the war there? Okay. Yeah. This in is 2004. Active combat still going on. And... My dad had invited me, so I just went. I didn't pray about it myself. You know, I, <laughs> you know it's, a, it's, a, it's a little dangerous there, and I probably should have prayed about it. Hmm. And I was getting ready to, to go downstairs in the, in, uh, there in Maman, Jordan, and all of a sudden fear gripped me. Hmm. Like, I'm going into a war zone. I've got a young wife, two little kids. What the heck, hmm. you know? And, and I, I don't know why I all of a sudden did this, but I started questioning, and I said, have I been good enough mm. for God to protect me while I'm in a literal war zone, mm-hmm. okay, with tanks and guns and the whole nine? So I questioned. Mm. I was at that point that maybe you were, at, you know, have I been good enough? Mm. And the Lord freed me that morning by mm. speaking to me and saying, it'll never be what... It'll never be about whether you, what you have done or what you have not done, but what I did. Mm-hmm. And I went to Baghdad, enjoyed my trip, never thought about my safety. And the idea that grace sustained me, I didn't even know what to call it back then. Mm-hmm. Now that I've read your book mm-hmm. it's not and a been taught by <laughs> Joseph Prince and, and Creflo Dollar and, mm-hmm. and, and all of the teaching that's coming now, I realize grace set me free and from fear mm. of going into a yeah. war zone mm. and trying to help those believers in that air part of the world. <laughs> so with that, grace made us forget about ourselves mm. and go and do what God's called us to do. Yeah. It totally made us stop yeah. thinking about ourselves. And I think, you know, one, just sort of piggybacking on that, I think lots of people inside the church today think that Christian growth means I'm getting stronger and stronger and more and more competent every day. When when you read the Bible, what you discover is that Christian growth is not I'm getting stronger and stronger and more and more competent every day. It's I'm becoming increasingly aware of how weak and incompetent I am and how how strong and competent Jesus continues to be for me. He's the hero of the story. This whole thing is about him and what he's done. It's our only hope. And I'm... We need a we need a new reformation. Yes, we yeah. do. And this is the message that launched the first reformation yeah. back in the 1500s, early 1500s, and it desperately needs to be rediscovered by the church. Wow. Go you tell him. I can listen to you forever. <laughs> and those that want to, he is the senior pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church right here in Coral Ridge. Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Yeah. Fort Lauderdale, yeah. Yeah, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, right here. So Every Sunday, every Wednesday night, every Thursday mm-hmm. night, every Friday night, you're there. And they can listen online. Oh, uh, there, we live stream. Why? So they can find us online if they don't live right. here. But Tullian Chavigian has been our guest. His book is Many One Way books. Love. Amazing. And he's written a lot of books. But apparently, I think the quote of the night is, nothing else you can say. You're a broken record. Mm. It's grace. Mm. The end of religion is on us. Amen. 
Jesus Amen. came to declare the end of religion. That's right. And, and ultimately, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. That is the gospel. That the is good the good news, news of the gospel. <laughs> and it's being proclaimed. And I like the last line of your book. Uh, the very last thing you say is, it is finished. It is finished. And it really is done. <laughs> yes. Love Amen. it. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Charlie.